right, everyone. Let's sell now. <clears throat> so, uh, before we begin, um, are there any questions about uh, quizzes or homework three is already up on Blackboard? Anybody take a look at homework three? Not yet. Still, still suffering from the effects of the quiz. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So I think uh, we're maybe a lecture or so behind, uh, but I think we should be able to make up three ground since I've spent a lot of time on uh, the basics. So what I'll quickly do is uh, uh, remind you where we were last time, and then we'll continue off with this uh, calculus of uh, scalars, vectors, and tensors, um, and uh, hopefully that should be that uh, that will be the end of uh, this mathematical pre preliminaries the chapter one that we have been talking about um, so just to refresh your memory um, we uh, we were saying last time that all these physical quantities scalars vectors and tensors occur as fields uh, meaning each and every point in our deformable body has uh, is associated with different quantities and we want to be able to work with these fields how they vary from point to point um, strain, as you remember, is change in lengths over uh, original length, but that's sort of a 1D concept and uh, to be able to define strain in three dimensions, we need a little more uh, richness in that. So let's see, we were doing last time uh, an example of, uh, or the definition really, of a derivative of a scalar field in one dimension, which was this function f of x. Uh, we are very familiar with the definition of the derivative in one dimension, but I also suggested that a more general definition that is also applicable in 2D and 3D is given by this flux. So uh, flux of whatever function you have, it could be a scalar, a vector, a tensor, um, over the boundary of the body that you are considering or the small infinitesimal element that you are considering and divided by the measure of that body. In this case, it's a one-dimensional body, so it's a length is a measure. In a two-dimensional body, the area would be a measure. A three-dimensional, obviously, a volume would be a measure. So this definition of a derivative will scale very nicely for 2D and 3D, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, we also introduced uh, this or revised this uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, which allows you to um, do integrals. So just as, uh, uh, just as we had this function of a single variable, if we were to plot the derivative of that function, maybe something like this, and we want to calculate the integral of that derivative uh, between two points, as long as it is a continuous function, we, you're hopefully familiar with this construction that you can chop off the area under the surface in rectangles. And the sum that I have written out here this sum uh, of n rectangles as n tends to infinity will converge to the integral of this derivative, which have obviously will be the uh, difference in the values of the original function between a and b. Right? So you calculate the function value at a and b of the original function, that would be the area under the, surf, area under the curve for, uh, for the derivative. So here what we basically outlined was how it works for scalars in one dimension, okay? There are two things that we need to keep in mind, the derivatives and the integrals. This is the exact same thing when, that we try to talk about for scalars, vectors, and tensors in 2D and 3D, okay? So these two operations is what we're, we're going to talk about. Let's take a first look at what a scalar field even looks like in 2D and 3D. So a scalar field in 1D, as I just pointed out, was just a function, f of x, right? In 2D, when you have x and y, or maybe you want to call it x1 and x2, so you have a plane, x1 and x2. At each point in the plane, you have some function value, okay? That's what a function would look like in 2D. So this plane right here, it goes from minus three to plus three, minus three to plus three, 
and if you go to any point on that plane, you have this function. This function could be some weird function, but it has it's a unique scalar function of two variables. You can plot the value of that function in the third dimension. That's what a scalar fun uh, function of two variables looks looks like. And let me see if I, if I yeah I do have this figure um, on MATLAB as well. So um, you can see that this function, um, if you actually were to try to rotate this function, uh, or maybe take a top view of this function, that you have now one of the axes which is x1, the other axis x2. Go to any point in that plane x1, x2, and the color represents its value. More red means more positive values, more blue means more negative values. So that's what a function of a, a scalar function of two variables looks like. Any guesses what a scalar, so actually before I do that, uh, you can represent that scalar function as a color or you can visualize it uh, as a function value in 3D, in, in the third dimension. So for 2D functions, you'd still have the third dimension to represent its value. But the question is, what do you do for a three-dimensional scalar field? Yeah, you can use color. So you don't have a fourth dimension to plot a function value. So uh, for three-dimensional scalar fields, for example, in this body that I'm showing, maybe I could be plotting temperature or I could be plotting some component of stress. Um, and again, uh, along the color bar, you have the function values. So in 3D, you don't have an option of plotting it like a surface or something. You have to use colors to plot a scalar function value. That's what it looks like. That's what a function, uh, scalar function of three variables looks like. All right. So first derivative that we are going to look at is something called a directional derivative. Um, so let me try to first explain what the concept is, and then we'll see how we can compute uh, this directional derivative. The idea is that, um, that given a scalar function, given a scalar function of two variables or of three variables, let's, let's say we, have, we are talking about this scalar function, um, you want to find its derivative at some point in the x1, x2 space. Okay? So I'll go to some point in that x1, x2 space, give me a point, uh, go to that point, I have the function value at that point and I also want to know how the function varies in the neighborhood of that point. Okay. Now let me ask you this. If is there a unique value of how the function varies at that point? Meaning um, is there some uh, just like in 1D if I ask you how does the function vary at a point you could just say df dx that's the derivative that's how it varies at that point. In 2D if I'm at a point, I have a, I'm at some point on this surface, I could be sloping down this way, here, here, the slopes could be different in all different directions, right? So it's very important to recognize that if you're at a point in 2D in different directions, you might have different values of the derivative. The function will be changing at different rates. And that's exactly what this directional derivative captures. So for example, if I'm at a point x, if I go in some direction n from x, in that direction, uh, the, deriv the rate of change of that function in that direction will be what the directional derivative would be. As, so uh, for example, um, if you consider my arm here to be the x vector, and this pen here to be the n vector, then as I go in all different directions, the value of the function will change at different rates. Maybe in some direction the value decreases, maybe in the opposite direction the value increases, maybe in the perpendicular direction the value remains the same of the function. Okay, So that's what a directional derivative captures. And the way it is defined is this, that we will calculate the function value x plus some small number epsilon in the direction of n. Can you tell me what this this thing is, you're talking about the function value at x, that, that was the original point x, we will move in the direction of n by a small amount epsilon, that's what this number is, right, or this vector is, x plus epsilon n, 
we are going to subtract that from the function value at x and we are going to divide that thing by epsilon which is very similar to the definition of the 1d derivative that we had up here f of x minus fx f of x plus delta x minus fx divided by delta x right that's very similar to what we have uh, here and of course in the limit epsilon tending to zero so we are going at a point x and uh, going a small amount epsilon in a given direction n and then taking the difference of the function values between those two points and dividing it by the epsilon right so epsilon is like delta x uh, in in that 1d but of course um, here you need to specify two things to find directional derivative you need to specify the point at which you want to find the di directional derivative of f and you also have to specify the direction in which you want to find uh, in the derivative in 1d it is just uh, you point you, you you say uh, what is the derivative of this function at a point x at 1 say for example here you're not only going to say what is the directional derivative of this function at the point 0 comma 0 but also in the direction say 1 comma 0 right all right so this is sort of the formal definition of the directional derivative um, and we can show that this happens to be the same as d over d epsilon of f of x plus epsilon n you calculate the derivative of that function first and after you take after you calculate the derivative you set epsilon equal to zero right so um, so this is important to understand that we are going to finally set epsilon equal to zero because we need to find the limit in which epsilon tends to zero right uh, but we are always going to take the derivative of a given function first after taking the derivative we set epsilon equal to zero so we'll, i'll give you an example of this and of course the result of all of that will be what what will be the result of this type of uh, will it be a scalar a vector a tensor or what a scalar right because i have a scalar up here uh, subtracting a scalar dividing by a scalar indeed the result will be a scalar even though it's two dimensions of course or three dimensions for that matter so here's an example consider a scalar function x dot product with x question yeah okay so uh, you remember why we took the limit delta x tend to zero here right if i want to find the derivative of a function x uh, fx at point x I take the value at delta x and then tends to zero is gives me the slope. The same reason here, if I am at a, some point on the surface, I'll go epsilon away from that point uh, in some direction n. And then I want to figure out when epsilon tends to zero, what is the instantaneous or the local rate of change of that function at that point, okay? Um, all right. So let's consider this function f of x equal to x dot x. Is this a scalar function? Is this a scalar function? <laughs> it is because uh, you have x dot x, so the result would be a scalar, right? So it's a scalar function of a vector variable or a, uh, or a position vector. So again, in two dimensions, x1, x2, it would look like what? What would, what would this x dot x look like? What does, what does x square in one dimension, if I have x1 dot x1 is basically x square, what does x square look like? It's a parabola, right? Uh, zero at zero, and it kind of increases like this. In x2, you have the same parabola, exactly the same, and in any other direction, it'd be like a sort of an intermediate parabola. So if you take that 
one dimensional parabola and kind of revolve it around the y axis, that's what x square would look like, right? Indeed, that is very, uh, conceptually it is similar to this idea that if I have x1, x2, I, uh, I am plotting a surface of, uh, of, uh, of that function. So, um, now what I want to find out is its directional derivative in some direction n. I don't, I don't know what that direction is, it could be any direction, but um, I want to find out its directional derivative in some direction n. So what we'll do is to follow the definition, this definition right here. We're going to say that it is equal to d over d epsilon of of the function of the same function of x plus epsilon n. So what that means is that wherever I have x, I'm going to replace that with x plus epsilon n. If I do that, what we get is epsilon n dot with x plus epsilon n. I'll first take the derivative and after I take the derivative, I will set epsilon equal to zero. So if I do that, what I should get is d over d epsilon of x dot with x plus 2 epsilon x dot with n plus n dot, sorry, epsilon square n dot with n. Take the derivative and after taking the derivative set epsilon equal to 0. So let me ask you this, um, what is the derivative of x dot x with respect to epsilon? 0. There is no epsilon in there. Uh, derivative of 2 epsilon x dot n? Just 2 x dot n because derivative of epsilon would be 1. Derivative of epsilon square n dot n, okay, so 2 epsilon n dot n, right, and if I finally, so I'll write that out explicitly here, um, it would be equal to 2 x dot x, and just for the sake of argument, I'll also write 2 epsilon n dot n, but just as I said, if I set epsilon equal to 0 here, after taking the derivative, this epsilon also goes away. Am I missing something? Oh, sorry, x dot n, not x dot x. Two x dot n, and after taking this derivative, I'm setting epsilon equal to 0. So, what I'm left with is 2 times x dot with n. Now this is the directional derivative of that scalar function in any direction n you want. Let's check. Um, if I am at some point, maybe I can pull up that function as well. Um, Right. So this is what that x square function looks like, right? Um, um, I'm just plotting it between minus 2 to plus 2 on x1, minus 2 to plus 2 on x2. And again, I could uh, rotate this and see that from the top view, actually, it should be perfect uh, circle. So that we can get with axis equal. Right. So that's the top view of that function. Blue values are closer to zero. Blue values are closer to zero. Red values mean, mean increasing functions. And of course, in 3D, it looks kind of like that, uh, x squared in all, all, in all the two dimensions. Now, question here. If I'm at a point on the surface, what is the greatest? So let's say uh, uh, I'm at some point starting from the origin. This is the origin right here. And if I'm at some point, say one comma one, then I'm at some point up here on the surface. Okay, one comma one. Um, 
what is the direction of the greatest increase of the function? Normal direction. Say that again. Normal direction. Normal to what? Normal to the surface. Normal to the surface. Uh, the surface is actually in PD, right? So maybe just so that we don't think about in those terms, let me look at the top view. This is the 2D function that we have. So I'm at some point 1 comma 1. At that point, if I want to uh, find how the function changes, obviously it changes by different amounts in different directions. What is the direction of the greatest increase of this function? The radial direction, which happens to be same as the position vector in this case. Right? X is also a radial direction. So X indeed is if I take the if, if I take this value and if I choose n the direction in which I want to find the derivative if I take n same as x uh, a unit vector same in the x direction then the dot product would be maximum correct mm -hmm. dot product would be maximum because cosine of 0 would be 1 that's what dot product does in any other direction cosine of that angle would be less than 1 it would the direction of greatest decrease will be negative x right because cosine of that angle between x and n will be uh, will be negative one what would be the direction of no function change tangential direction so basically if i were to um, if i were to go in this figure at some point 1 comma 1 here then in this direction is the greatest increase this direction is the greatest decrease and the tangential direction is the greatest uh, or the tangential direction is the direction for no change so depending upon the value of n you are getting different amounts of directional derivatives which makes sense because in different directions uh, the function value will change by different amounts right okay um, so once again, um, what we uh, do to find a directional derivative is uh, is to take the derivative of the given function, wherever in that given function we have x, we replace that with x plus epsilon x. We take the derivative first. After taking the derivative, we set epsilon equal to 0. And what we are left with is the directional derivative. And I think physically understanding what it means is more <coughs> important than Sort of knowing how to compute it. Um, how about in 3D? Can this function be extended to 3D? Can this concept directional derivative be extended to 3D? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, indeed, because in 3D, just like I was telling you, uh, a scalar function is represented by colors, right? So just like on that right hand side picture, uh, that could be an example of, this could be an example of a scalar field over this body. What would this particular scalar field look like, x dot x in 3D, what would it look like? Any thoughts? Uh, similar to that, uh, so this was what it looked like in 2D on a plain paper. If we plot the color, we have uh, zero values are blue, increasing values are red. In 3D, it would be a similar picture, but except you know, except on a plane, it would be in 3D. So at the origin, you would have blue. As you move out, you'd have more and more red. Right. So in any radial direction from the origin. It would be spheres instead of circles. Right? So that's what I'm showing you on this figure as well. From the origin, if you move outwards, you would have contour surfaces. So we think of them as contour surfaces where the closest to the origin is the blue close to zero. And of course, away concentric spheres would be increasing values. That's what uh, this scalar field x dot x would look like in 3D. Okay, now to the question, if I'm at some point in this three-dimensional space, I, am, I have some color at that point, that color represents the function value. 
So 1, 1, 1, 1. Let's say if I'm at that point, 1, 1, 1, 1. I have the function value. What's the function value at that point? Um, yeah, <laughs> you're right, 3. Um, x dot x would be 1 or e1 plus e2 plus e3 dot with e1 plus e2 plus e3 and indeed that is 3. The function value at 1 comma 1 comma 1 is 3. And what would be the direction of greatest increase of the function? Again the radial direction, right? So if I'm at 1 comma 1 comma 1, I want to keep on going in that direction to get the maximum increase of the function, which again is not surprising because this value that we cal calculated still holds this directional derivative that we calculate still holds in 3d also the dot product means the same thing cosine of the angle between two vectors right so um, and of course the direction of greatest decrease would be negative x just like it was in the 2d case but what about direction of no increase of function uh, so there is yeah so the contour surface is a sphere now right which means that if I'm at a point on that contour surface x, there are infinitely many directions that are tangent to the surface at that point. If you are at that point, and if you are within that surface, any direction within that surface is a tangent to that surface, and that would be a direction of no increase or decrease of that function. So if your n is, is in that surface, you do not change the function value, okay? So, a little bit of uh, three-dimensional imagining is needed here, uh, but uh, essentially the concept is very similar to what you had uh, in 1D. All we are doing is we are extending it to 2D and 3D, and since there is 2D and 3D, we have this um, additional complication of uh, defining a direction of change. Questions? Any particular question on this? All right, I'll let you digest all of that. Um, let me talk about a different type of a derivative of a scalar field. Um, this is a gradient of a scalar field, okay? Um, gradient of a scalar field is the direction and actually magnitude of the maximum change, especially maximum increase of a scalar field. So we've been talking about this x dot x function which can be written as xi dot xi xi, right? i is repeated, so that means x1, x1 plus x2, x2 plus x3, x3. Um, in terms of components, it's given by this, uh, by this function. You take the scalar field that is given to you, take its partial derivative with respect to x1 in the direction e1 plus partial derivative in x2, in the direction e2 and e3, uh, x3 and e3. Um, what does that physically mean? Again, if I'm at a point uh, in the two-dimensional space, for example, if I'm at a point in the two-dimensional space, again, I'll pick one comma one point right here. Um, then the gradient at that point is basically how fast does the function change and in what direction? The, the greatest increase in the function value at that point, um, what is the rate of increase and the direction of increase, which means that the result of this gradient function, gradient derivative is going to be a vector. So at that point, I will have some vector pointing outward um, because outward radially outward pointing direction is the greatest increase of that function value. Not only that, if I go to some point closer to the origin, the vector that will, that I'll have would be smaller in magnitude. Why is that? Change is slower near the origin, right? So I'll go back to um, maybe the corresponding 1D concept. If I were to plot a 1D function x square, something like this, then um, at 1, I have the function value as 1. Um, 
and the derivative is 2x, right? df dx is 2x. So the derivative is also, also represents the slope. The slope at a point out here at, in x is much greater. The slope at a point here is smaller. At even closer to the origin, it is even smaller, correct? As x increases, the slope of that increase also increases. Um, that's exactly the same thing that's going on in this figure. At the origin, um, at the origin, the directional derivative is what? What is the directional derivative of this function in any direction at the origin? Why is it zero? Uh, the slope is zero and uh, uh, can we prove it somehow? That's true. So derivative uh, or the directional derivative uh, of that function at any point is given by two times x dot n. <coughs> x is zero, directional derivative is zero, right? Um, if, if I go to a point out here at any point x, so if this is, this is the origin right here, 0 comma 0 is the origin. If I go to some point x in the same direction is the greatest increase, which is what I was plotting here um, with this function. In the direction x, the, uh, the increase, the rate of increase of x keeps on increasing, right? Because the derivative is 2x here. So what this means in this two-dimensional figure is that, um, where is that? That the derivative of this function, this is the x square or x dot x function in two dimensions. If I were to look at the gradient, it would produce a vector. It would produce a vector uh, and the vector uh, at each point would produce a vector phi. So the gradient of a scalar function or a scalar field is a vector field. So, and what would that vector field look like? That vector field would look like this. If I'm at the origin, my derivatives are zero. So zero, no arrows here. If I go to some point, one comma one, I have my vector field pointing outward in that direction and, the, and an arrow there. As I keep on going outward, the length of that arrow increases. Okay, looks like um, <laughs> looks like it's all getting more difficult to digest, right? Um, so, uh, so okay, this this will require some uh, imagination on your part. Um, you have to um, basically first of all understand what uh, what what this derivative would look like. Um, in this particular case, the scalar field we have is just one function value, which we represented with color or the height of the surface. We want to know how uh, how it changes and the, what is the fastest increase, fat, fastest direction of increase. So if I go to some point here, uh, the arrow at that point represents what uh, represents the direction and the magnitude of that increase. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see what the gradient of this particular function looks uh, uh, looks like. We know that it, it, it can be calculated in terms of components as df, um, dx, i, and ei, which means um, partial of xi, xi, partial of xj, ej. Is this expression that I've written different from this expression? This expression here, is that different from this definition that I gave you? I did use j there, but that's perfectly fine because I cannot repeat i there. I, I've already used i here, right? So what would that be? How can I calculate this partial derivative? Partial of xi, xi with respect to xj. This is something that uh, you have done. So maybe take 
a minute to see if you can calculate what that partial derivative would be and then I'll do it on the screen. How do you get phi ej? Well, first of all, uh, note that on the right hand side you have two i's and two j's. Both are repeated indices. indices right? So you cannot have a phi index in your answer. So phi ej has j as a phi index. What's that? 2xj ej. Okay, let's see if that's correct. Uh, and how do you get that? We will first use the product rule on this. So we'll get um, partial of xi with respect to xj. And um, I'll keep xi out here and ej plus the derivative of the second one. So I will have xi partial xi, xj, and ej. All I did was break up that uh, xi, xi product into two terms. Okay. What is the derivative of xi with respect to xj? So maybe the way to think about that would be uh, partial of xi, xj, depending upon the values of i and j, could be one of nine values, right? When i is one, j is one, I have delta x1 with respect to x1, which is one partial of x1 with partial of x2 is zero, partial of x1 with partial of x3 is zero. Similarly, x2 with x1 is zero, x2 with x2 is 1, x2 with x3 is 0, and similarly you will get 3 more values. Does this look familiar? Right, it would be 0, 0, 1 here of x3 with x1, x3 with x2, and x3 with x3. And of, indeed, this is equal to delta ij, the chronicle delta. If i and j are the same, the value of this derivative is 1 i and j are different, the value is 0. So in both these cases, I get delta ij, delta ij, and I can contract j out with this j and replace it with i, this j and this j replace it with i, and what I get is xi ei plus xi ei, which is nothing but 2 xi ei which is nothing but 2x. What a surprise. Uh, I get 2x here. What was the derivative of x squared? 2x. Here as well, x dot x, the gradient of x dot x turned out to be 2x, the vector 2x. Okay. So again, the gradient of a scalar field came out to be a vector field. What does a vector field look like? It looks like a bunch of arrows. Each, each point in the space is associated with some arrow, some vector. That's what a vector field is, right? And indeed, at zero, there is zero vector. As you go out in x, you get bigger and bigger arrows that are proportional to the magnitude of x itself, okay? So think about, uh, uh, think about the scalar field as a function value 
for two dimensions, it will be a function value in the third dimension, or for three dimensions, it will be a function value related to color. That's what a scalar field looks like. A vector field looks like a bunch of arrows associated in the entire space. Right? If it's a 2D space, I'll have a plane which is full of arrows. If it's a 3D space, it would be, of course, a cube or a sphere full of uh, full of all these types of arrows. Okay, so, all right, I'll keep going here. Um, let me ask you this. This operation, the gradient, the way that I defined the gradient was, you give me a scalar field, I'll, uh, I'll find the direction and magnitude of the greatest increase of that function at each point in the space. That's how I define the gradient, right? In this definition, did I define a coordinate system? No, gradient is something that is a physical concept. You give me a scalar field, I'll go to each point in that scalar field and find the direction and magnitude of the greatest increase of that function. That's what a gradient is. In that definition, I have not used a coordinate system anywhere, but the way that I defined the gradient here, it does use a coordinate system, right? So to get away from, or to come up with a more general definition of a gradient that does not use a coordinate system, we can define it in this manner. So in 2D, the gradient can be defined as the same definition that we came up with in the one dimensional case. We will say that we will take the function value f, it's a scalar function, and I will take the flux of that function, right? So remember the 1D definition. Um, flux of f over the boundary of delta x and divided by the measure of that delta x. So let's try to extend that to 2D. I have some space x1, x2 in 2D. I have some scalar function f. I'll go to a point x, define a small body, a small in infinitesimal area around that. Uh, I'm calling that area here as this uh, area b. I'm going to also take the flux of that function, which would be f times n. That's what the 1D thing was, right? F times N, that's the a, that's a flux of that function. I'm going to take the integral of that area um, over the entire boundary of that element. The boundary of this element is this square boundary in this case. It doesn't have to be square. It could be any arbitrary infinitesimal area here. So the integral of F over the boundary of this body B, I'm going to write that here. Uh, boundary of this body B um, and divided by 1 over area of that body, area of that patch B, which is the measure of that, the area of that patch is in the denominator flux of that function over the boundary of that patch is in the numerator. Uh, the flux has to be an integral because this is two dimensions. In two dimensions, the boundary is a curve, right? If I, if I have a two dimensional surface, the boundary of that surface would be a curve. So to find the flux of anything over the boundary of a, of a surface, I would have to do a surface or a curve, uh, a line integral over that curve. Okay, so that's how a two-dimensional gradient is defined. Um, indeed, it would be a vector because already you can see f, at f times n, scalar times a vector integral would give me a vector. So that would associate a vector field with, uh, as a gradient of a scalar field. In the same way, in three dimensions, I now have a small cube, for example. If I have a scalar field in 3D, I go to a point, find some small infinitesimal body around that point and the boundary of that small body would be what? A line, an area, a point, or what? Uh, boundary of that, so let's say, yeah, it, could, it would be a surface. If it's a three-dimensional object, the boundary of that three-dimensional object would be a surface. So, um, 
to, to find again the uh, gradient of that function, I'll take the function, multiply that with the outward normal n on the boundary. So for example, on this face, the outward normal could be n pointing this way. On each one of those six faces, the outward normal could be pointing in those six directions. I'm taking the function value times n, that's the flux. Take the integral of that dA over the boundary of B. That's a surface integral. So maybe just to make it more explicit, I'll do a double integral here. And I have to divide it by its measure. In this case, the measure would be the volume of that body B. And in all of those definitions, I was missing something. Any any idea what I was missing? Limit. Limit of the measure of that body tending to zero, right? So um, this is the same as the 1D de definition also. Um, maybe it should be volume of B tending to zero. In this case, limit of area of B tending to zero. So in both cases, I have exactly the same definition that I had back in the 1D case, that, um, that flux of that function over the boundary of, a, of an infinitesimal body, body divided by a measure of that body with the limit of that measure tending to zero. That's how a derivative is defined. And clearly that's a definition that works in 2D and 3D as well. Um, very quickly, I'll also verify that this definition or this definition gives me exactly this up here, the one that I defined with the coordinate system. And I'll actually not go through the details of this derivation, but I'll kind of explain that and, and let you figure the rest of it out. Uh, to verify that, uh, that to find the, deri uh, find the gradient, to verify that to the gradient of a scalar function gives me a vector field given by this df dx i pi. Let's see, let's try to apply it for a particular uh, choice of that infinitesimal body. In this case, my x is at the corner of that point, okay? So I have a scalar field at the corner of that point. I have this x and I'm going to take my body b as a cube of side delta x1, delta x2, and delta x3. That's my cube. Finally, I'm going to tend all of these delta x1, delta x2, delta x3 as zero, but let's see what the flux of that function is. Um, this body, of course, has six bounding surfaces, right? To calculate the flux of that function on those six surfaces, I will have to do uh, the function value on this face times E1 plus function value on this face times minus E1, function value on top face times E2, bottom face times E3, uh, minus E2, and the back face times minus E3 plus the front face times plus E3. So if, if you write all of that out, you will see that you get something long like this, the function value at the face times the normal plus the function value at the other face times the negative of that normal. If you sum that over i to i going from one to three, you've covered all of these six faces, okay? So this thing right here, f times n dA over the area or the bounding area of that body B is the six surfaces given by this expression. So first you have to convince yourself of that, that the flux is given by that sum over three directions. You do some simplification there, and um, what you'll see is that you can, after some uh, manipulations that I will not go into, uh, just because we're running out of time here, um, you can show that uh, if you take this flux divided by this volume, the volume of course will be something like um, A1, that's A1 times delta X1, or it could be A2 times delta X2, or A3 times delta X3. Um, if you take that flux, divide it by its volume, do some manipulations, you get back to the original component definition that we had up there. So 
So the point is that this way of defining derivative or gradient of a scalar function using a coordinate independent, this, this definition does not rely upon any coordinates. It gives you back the coordinate dependent definition of the, of the gradient function, okay? All right, so let's stop here. And just as a suggestion, we are going to be delving very deep into this derivative business of scalar fields, vector fields, tensor fields. We're just getting warmed up right now, okay? So scalar fields is nothing. We'll go to vector fields and tensor fields. So if you, if, if it's been a time, if it's been some time before, since you've seen derivatives like divergence, curl, gradient, uh, uh, it, it might be worth your while to revise that and maybe even read ahead in the book and uh, and then we can have a more uh, you can bring your questions to class rather than sort of trying to revisit it for the first time during the lecture okay all right so I'll stop here we'll come back and finish this topic off on Monday and that will allow you to solve all of the problems on the homework but at least it's this this one should get you started on the first two problems I think okay Thank <laughs> you.